Hi folks, an exciting announcement to kick off the show. I've just released a unique set of bespoke badges of figures from the last thousand years of Irish history. These beautiful metal and enamel badges depict people you'll be familiar with from the podcast. These include the famous High King, Brian Brew, Diarmid McMurra, the man who played a central role in the Norman Conquest, Michael Davitt, the famine survivor, Fenian and leading figure in the Land War, and also Grace O'Malley, a.k.a. Grainne Whale, the famous Pirate Queen, as well as Countess Markovich. The badges, as I said, are made from metal and enamel, and the designs are unique. Indeed, three were actually created, especially by the Kerry artist Kiriuk for the badges. They are limited in number, but you can get yours now at irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash shop. That's irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash shop. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dwyer and this is The Revolutionary Life of Muriel McSweeney. This episode is a fascinating look at Muriel McSweeney, who was a very unlikely revolutionary. Born in 1892 into immense wealth in Cork City, she would turn her back on this life, first becoming an Irish Republican and then later a communist. Before we start, I want to fill you in on why the episode schedule is so out of kilter. This show is very late and it's not the episode many of you were expecting. That was supposed to be the final podcast in the series on the Great Hunger that I've been making for the last few years. I actually finished that episode but I felt myself it just wasn't good enough. To be honest, I'm a little burned out with the Great Famine and I don't feel I can do justice to the series I've made over the last three years. So I am going to park that episode on the legacy until next year. I know it might sound strange given I'm so close to the end of the series, but at the moment I know I just won't be able to do it justice. Now part of the reason is because I'm already excited about what's coming next. In 10 days time I have a really special episode called The Matter Hospital, where history was made. I recorded that this week in The Matter, Dublin's most famous hospital, and it covers what 19th century operations were like, the stories of hunger strikers in the hospital, and the surprising role The Matter played during the War of Independence. Then, following that, I have an episode recorded in a 500-year-old castle. This is all leading up, though, to my new series, Partisans, which looks at the story of Irish people who fought in the Spanish Civil War. That starts on November the 18th. While all this is coming down the line, I did want to get an episode out, so I have this show on Muriel McSweeney. The topic might sound familiar to a small minority of you. I released a show on Muriel, back in 2017 as part of another podcast I was trying to get off the ground. Now that never took off and very few people heard that episode. So without any further ado, let's begin the intriguing story of Muriel McSweeney. On the 26th of October 1982, the extraordinary life of the Irish revolutionary Muriel McSweeney came to an end. Tragically, she died almost entirely forgotten in a nursing home in Maidstone to the southeast of London. Few in her native Cork even knew she had passed. Indeed, no national Irish newspaper carried an obituary or even a notice to mark the death of this woman who had been a central figure in one of the pivotal events in the Irish War of Independence. Aged 90 at the time, McSweeney was among the last of Ireland's revolutionary generation to die. Her achievements in life were extraordinary. Born into one of Cork's most famous families, she had turned her back on a life of privilege to throw herself into the Republican movement in Cork around 1915. In the following years, she would go on to play a central role in the Irish War of Independence. Alongside what were impeccable Republican credentials, she was also a member of the Irish Communist Party before going on to fight alongside German communists as they tried to stop the Nazis' rise to power in the late 1920s. However, while she would spend most of her life involved in revolutionary movements of one kind or another, nothing of her early years indicated she would become a radical. Born Muriel Murphy in 1892, she was from an extremely wealthy and well-known Cork family. Her father, Nicholas Murphy, was the owner of the Cork Distilleries Company, famous for making Paddy's Whiskey and Cork Dry Gin. The family home was located in the affluent Cork suburb of Montanotti and the Murphys had four live-in servants to care for a family of just six children. 
However, the wealth of the Murphy family did not bring happiness and indeed judging on Muriel's later accounts of her childhood, it, if anything, left her lonely and isolated. Her nearest sibling was six years older than her and the natural isolation this created was enhanced by her parents' Victorian snobbery as they would not let her play with other children of her own age. Muriel would later say she was, and I quote, kept completely isolated as a child, not allowed to play with other children or even to speak to people outside the family. No one was considered good enough. While trapped in this opulent isolation, Muriel nevertheless developed a social conscience from a young age and even as a child she empathised with the horrific poverty that many children in Cork lived in. However, there was still very little in her childhood that indicated she would go on to become a revolutionary. Indeed, she herself described her family values as imperialist, conservative, capitalist and Roman Catholic and her parents did everything they could to inculcate young Muriel with these views. To this end, when she reached her teenage years, she was sent to a Catholic convent school in England in St. Leonard's on Sea near Hastings. This was, according to Muriel herself, to stop her coming into contact with, and I quote, common people in Irish schools. In 1909, Muriel was aged 17 when her father Nicholas, now in his early 80s, died. She also finished school that year and while she claims the attempts of the convent in St. Leonard's to make her into a lady had failed, she certainly would act the part between 1909 and 1914. There was still little sign of the communist she would become. For example, when later reflecting on her life, she made no reference to the struggle for women's suffrage or the major trade union dispute of this time, the 1913 knockout. This is not to say she was oblivious to them, but they don't appear to have been formative experiences in her life. Indeed, during these years, she was still living in her comfortable, affluent life. In 1909, she donated money for a memorial celebrating the Bishop of Cork's Silver Jubilee, an act which would presumably have embarrassed her later self, as she would become a well-known atheist. In the following years, she was occasionally mentioned in the papers attending high society marriages. However, Muriel was about to undergo a political transformation in her early 20s and while her politicisation was perhaps later in life than most, it would see her make a complete break with the world she had grown up in. Indeed, within a few short years, she would be something of a pariah to her former friends and associates. For Muriel and her generation, it was a series of events between 1914 and 1918 that transformed their world. These began with the outbreak of the First World War in August 1914, the following years of mass slaughter on the Western Front, the 1916 rising in Ireland, the subsequent wave of repression that followed it, and then the threat to introduce conscription into Ireland, all profoundly changed life on the island. At the outbreak of the First World War in 1914, Muriel, coming from a unionist family, did what might be expected of her when she volunteered at the South Infirmary Hospital in Cork to nurse wounded British Army soldiers being sent back from the front in France. However, her motivations were purely humanitarian rather than any sense of patriotism or belief in the British war effort, something she considered a source of, and I quote, criminally appalling suffering. Unsurprisingly, she would quit this position after six weeks as she was concerned some would confuse her humanitarianism for pro-British sympathies. She was aged around 24 at this point and around late 1914 and early 1915 she began to frequent a famous Cork bookshop operated by Liam Russell, an Irish language enthusiast and Republican activist. Muriel herself had a great love of the Irish language and she soon found herself at home in Russell's where she was increasingly exposed to new ideas. The bookshop stocked newspapers that were produced by Ireland's radical movements. These would include the socialist newspaper The Workers' Republic edited by the revolutionary socialist James Connolly along with several other republican and nationalist publications. Through reading these, Muriel began to develop what were considered increasingly radical views. While she would eventually become a lifelong communist, in Ireland in 1915, she, like most radicals, gravitated towards the movement demanding Irish independence from the British Empire. At Russell's bookshop, which is incidentally still open in Cork, she began to meet leading radicals in the city. These included senior figures in the Republican movement, Tomás McCurtain and Liam de Rochte, who were regulars at the shop. In 1915, she would encounter another key figure in the Cork Republican movement, 
Terence McSweeney. She had seen McSweeney address the crowd at a meeting commemorating the Manchester Martyrs, three Irish Republicans executed in England in 1867, and they would meet later again that year at the home of mutual acquaintances, and they would soon become an item. Through 1915, Muriel became increasingly involved in the Republican movement and also the wider McSweeney family, developing a friendship with Mary McSweeney, the older sister of Terence and another prominent Republican activist in Cork City. It was in late 1915 or early 1916 that Muriel took a major step when she joined the Common Naman, the women's paramilitary movement and sister organisation to the Irish Volunteers, the forerunner to the IRA. Unsurprisingly, it was around this point that her relationship with her family deteriorated. In Ireland in 1916, she could not have had more different political views than those of her siblings and mother. While Muriel was a staunch Republican, her eldest brother Nicholas was a supporter of Edward Carson, the Unionist leader and arch-enemy of Irish Republicanism, while her mother considered Irish Republicans cowards and criminals. Meanwhile, her growing friendship with the working-class McSweeney family was anathema to her family's snobbish values. Unsurprisingly, given what was to follow in 1916, relations with her family completely broke down and while she remained living at the family home, they no longer spoke to her. In April 1916, the Republican movement of which Muriel was part of was transformed by the Easter Rising of that year. While the conflict was centred in Dublin, there was no attempt at an insurrection in Cork, but the Republican movement across the country suffered a wave of repression that followed in the wake of the rebellion. In the following weeks, Mary McSweeney, Tomás McCurtain and Terence McSweeney, with whom Muriel was now in a relationship, were all arrested. As the city's leading Republicans, Terence, along with McCurtain, were sent to a prison camp in Frongoch in Wales. While this coincided with the development of Muriel and Terence's relationship and he would be released at Christmas 1916, they would have little semblance of a normal courtship in the coming months. Within two months of his release, Terence was re-arrested and on this occasion he was sent to Bromyard in Hertfordshire in England. Although neither tried nor charged with any offence, he was held in what might be considered an open prison. The British military paid for his accommodation in Bromyard and while allowed to move around the town, McSweeney was prohibited from leaving the wider area. Essentially, he was being kept away from Ireland. Muriel travelled to England to meet Turns, and the couple were engaged in Bromyard on March 3rd, 1917, a development that caused further tension with Muriel's own family. Even though Terence McSweeney, a devout Catholic, tried to get the Bishop of Cork, Daniel Colohan, to intercede, Muriel's mother refused to accept a radical working-class Republican as her son-in-law. While this delayed the marriage, it could not stop it. The couple would wait until Muriel's 25th birthday, a crucial date in her life when she received her inheritance, and on the following day she married Terence in Bromyard. The marriage party, captured for posterity in the photograph associated with this podcast, took meticulous planning. A small group travelled from Ireland for the wedding, including Terence's sisters, Mary and Annie. The well-known Dublin Capuchin friar, Augustine Hayden, who tended to the 1916 leaders in Kilmainham jail before their execution, also travelled to perform the ceremony. The leading Irish Republican and later Chief of Staff of the IRA, Richard Mulcahy, was the best man, while Muriel's friend, the Irish language activist, Geraldine O'Sullivan, was the bridesmaid. A military uniform of the Irish volunteers was smuggled to England for turns to wear, and while this may have been fitting for a Republican couple, it would undoubtedly have horrified Muriel's family, none of whom attended. Married life, however, brought little stability to what had already been a difficult courtship for Muriel and Terence, who had fitted their relationship around their political activism. Nevertheless, a few weeks after the ceremony, Terence was released from captivity, and in the summer of 1917, Muriel fell pregnant. The happiness of their marriage, however, was short-lived. Terence was re-arrested on November the 17th, 1917 for drilling members of the Volunteers. Incarcerated in Cork Prison, he would lead a mass hunger strike which secured victory within four days with all prisoners being released. However, the lessons learned from this would have terrible consequences. Their married life was interrupted again less than five months later when Terence was arrested in March 1918. While Muriel was heavily pregnant at the time, Terence began what was almost a tour of prisons, spending time in Dublin, Belfast and Dundalk before finally being moved to Lincoln Jail in England, where the leadership of the Irish Republican movement, including the sole surviving leader of the 1916 Rising, Eamon de Valera, were being held. 
This put immense strain on the pregnant Muriel as she travelled around visiting her husband in these prisons. While she did return to Cork to give birth to her daughter, who she named Moira, she took to the road again, bringing the baby to meet her father when she could. Meanwhile, during this period, support for Sinn Féin, the Republican political party, was growing rapidly in Ireland, and despite the fact he was incarcerated, Terence was elected MP for Sinn Féin for the constituency of Mid-Cork in the general election of December 1918. On his release in March 1919, he arrived back to an Ireland much changed in the few months he had been away. In January 1919, the War of Independence had begun with attacks on British soldiers and policemen increasing. Meanwhile, Max Sweeney and other Sinn Féin MPs, having refused to take their seats in the British Parliament, had convened a parliament in Dublin known as the First Doyle, a major step towards Irish independence. While the War of Independence intensified, Terence himself was involved in the political end of the struggle and in early 1920 he stood in local elections, which saw him returned as a councillor for Cork Corporation. In those local elections of January 1920, Sinn Féin had swept the boards and this, along with the growing upheaval of the War of Independence, opened a lethal phase in Cork politics. As they now dominated Cork Corporation, Sinn Féin were in a position to elect the Mayor of the city and Terence and Muriel's close friend Thomas McCurtain became the first Republican Lord Mayor of Cork. However, McCurtain wasn't in the job three months before he was shot dead under orders from the police. This murder shocked the world. McCurtain was killed on his 36th birthday at his home in front of his pregnant wife and their children. With tensions rising in Cork, Sinn Féin still had control of Cork Corporation and they now selected their second mayor in the space of three months. The unenviable task fell to Muriel's husband, Terence. While it had once been unimaginable that a man from his background would rise to this position, for Muriel and Terence there was little to celebrate. Muriel herself later bluntly stated, it meant, of course, the end of his life. Indeed, it appears she immediately felt threatened by the change in her circumstances. Not long after Terence became Lord Mayor, Muriel herself moved out of Cork City with their young daughter Moira to the town of Yall, presumably as a safety precaution. However, in August 1920, her worst nightmares began to materialise. Her husband Terence was arrested while presiding over a meeting in City Hall in Cork, which the British Army claimed was being used as a cover for a meeting of the Cork IRA. After his arrest, events began to spiral. Immediately Terence went on hunger strike in protest and a few days later he was taken before a British Army court-martial and tried. His sister Mary McSweeney travelled to Yall to allow Muriel attend the court-martial and while she knew and shared her husband's politics, her worst fears were confirmed. Terence firstly refused to recognise the court, stating, I am the Lord Mayor of this city and its Chief Magistrate and I declare this court illegal and that all taking part in it are liable to be arrested under the laws of the Irish Republic. He then went on to say that he would, dead or alive, be a free man within a month. What he meant by this was that he would continue his hunger strike until the British authorities released him or alternatively he died. Nevertheless, there was reason to be hopeful. Terence had already won one hunger strike back in 1917 when he and several Republicans had refused food in protest in Cork Prison, a move which secured their rapid release. However, the British government in 1920 took a different, more hardline approach and they prepared to face down McSweeney. Their first move was to isolate Terence. After his conviction, he was put on a submarine and taken to England where he was imprisoned in Brixton Jail. With both sides adamant they wouldn't back down, no one had any idea what would happen next. Most, including Terence himself, assumed he would not last very long. The last Irish Republican to die on hunger strike had been Thomas Ashe in 1917, who had died just five days after his hunger strike began when the prison authorities force-fed him. Indeed, after Terence was on strike for eight days, he would write to Muriel from Brixton Jail on August 20th, 1920, telling her to prepare to travel at short notice. Muriel would soon move to Brixton and began to visit her husband every day, joining a round-the-clock vigil which was being maintained by her and several other Irish Republicans. She was also acting, to a certain extent, as a press officer for the Republican movement in this instance. 
This left her in what must have been a very difficult position in late August when she had to read a communique to the press from Terence stating he was prepared to die. His words as she read them were We must be prepared for casualties in the last battle for Irish independence. Let every man offer his life and the future of the Irish Republic will be safe. God is with us. For Muriel, while she was McSweeney's wife, she was also a determined Republican activist and throughout the strike she appears to have put her own personal concerns aside and focused on wider political goals. By late August, the hunger strike and by extension Muriel herself was an international news story. However, even though scuffles were breaking out outside Brixton jail as large numbers of Irish people gathered at the prison, the British government refused to budge. The Prime Minister, Lloyd George, was insistent that they would not release McSweeney. He, as we have seen, was equally determined. By the end of August, newspapers now were beginning to report that Terence was on the verge of death and tensions continued to grow. He survived the month and in early September, Irish-American pressure was being brought to bear as the Mayor of New York publicly appealed for McSweeney's release. Muriel building on this, called on the US President Woodrow Wilson to intervene. In her letter, she pointed out the hypocrisy of the USA having fought World War I on the basis that small nations should be free and now Britain, their main ally, was essentially starving McSweeney to death for precisely doing that. By this stage, Terence himself was so weak he was struggling to communicate and his death appeared imminent. The pressure growing on Muriel was immense as prison doctors tried to get her to convince him to come off the strike, but she refused, saying she never interfered with her husband on matters of conscience. She would later say, what could be a greater wickedness than to try to keep Terence alive when he wished to die? Refusing to ask Terence to stop must have been an immensely difficult thing, given Muriel herself, politically speaking, did not agree with hunger striking on tactical grounds. She believed someone like Terence would be far more effective alive than dead. To this end, she did contact the Chief of Staff of the IRA, a man who had been Terence's best man, Richard Mulcahy, and another leading IRA figure, Cahill Brewer, asking them to order Terence to stop. She later explicitly claimed she did this in her capacity as a Republican activist rather than his wife. In any case, Mulcahy and Brewer did not agree. Meanwhile, the hunger strike was causing major tension in Ireland for different reasons. While many were impressed by Terence McSweeney's courage, others vilified him. The Catholic Church, for example, contemplated excommunicating him on the basis that his hunger strike constituted a form of suicide. This surely influenced Muriel's later total rejection of religion, but we'll come to this in time. As the month of September dragged on, the world's press was amazed that McSweeney could survive as he passed day 40, then day 50, and then the 60-day mark, having taken no food. Demonstrations were organised across the world with the future communist leader of Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh, and Marcus Garvey, the black nationalist leader, campaigning for his release. Even the King of England, George V, favoured releasing McSweeney, but he would not say this in public. Ultimate power in the United Kingdom lay with the Prime Minister and Lloyd George would not move. Eventually, in late October, as he passed the 70-day mark, Terence became delirious and had to be given morphine. And inevitably, on October the 25th, 1920, aged only 41, Terence McSweeney died in Brixton Jail, having been on hunger strike for 74 days. His body was brought back to Ireland where the Republican movement planned to organise major public demonstrations as the coffin passed through the cities and towns from Dublin to Cork. However, the British authorities seized his corpse before it could reach Dublin and brought it by sea to Cork. In spite of this, Republicans in Dublin went ahead and symbolically drove an empty hearse through tense streets as thousands lined the route. His funeral went ahead in Cork in a show of major Republican strength in the city. However, Muriel was still in England. She had been broken by the hunger strike and was too weak to travel back to Ireland for the funeral. However, no matter how emotionally exhausted she was, she was given little time to recover. While her husband had died in what was perhaps the most drawn out and emotionally charged way imaginable, she, as a Republican activist, was central to how his death would be publicised. In December 1920, Irish Americans organised a commission in Washington on conditions in Ireland to consolidate US opinion behind the Republican movement and they invited Muriel to travel and testify. 
She did not want to go, but when senior figures in the Irish Republican movement asked her, she felt compelled to travel. In late November 1920, only a few weeks after Terence's death, she set off across the Atlantic. At this point she was in a figure of international renown and when the boat arrived in New York she was swamped by the press before she could even disembark. She went on to testify at the Commission on Irish Conditions in Washington and also spoke at numerous public meetings. Before she left the USA she was granted the honour of becoming the first woman ever to be granted the freedom of New York. Muriel arrived back in Ireland in early 1921 as the War of Independence was reaching its key phase. In the following summer, an uneasy truce was agreed between the Irish Republican movement and the British government. Preliminary negotiations took place before a full delegation from Ireland travelled to London late in 1921. However, around this time, Muriel was extremely ill and she went to Wiesbaden in Germany to recuperate. It was there she would hear the nature of the treaty that was agreed in London. Ireland was to be formally partitioned and the southern 26 counties, while gaining a form of independence, did not receive full independence. This horrified Muriel and seems to have crushed her politically. Given everything she had been through, her statement that it was the greatest ever personal tragedy that had befallen on me up to that time reflects how important politics were to her. Arriving back in Ireland in 1922, Muriel was in the country as Ireland moved towards a civil war and she was involved in the early stages of the conflict. While complex in origin, the war was essentially fought by two wings of the Irish Republican movement over aspects of the treaty, with those who believed it should be endorsed taking power in the southern 26 counties and those who opposed the treaty becoming rebels in the country they had fought to create. Muriel opposed to the treaty, was part of a garrison that occupied the Hammam Hotel in Dublin under the leadership of the veteran Republican Carl Brewer. The subsequent shelling of this building in the opening stages of the Civil War was presumably Muriel's first direct experience of warfare. By July though, the anti-treaty forces to which Muriel belonged had been defeated in Dublin and she herself was arrested, but given her profile she was not held for long. After her release, she left Ireland and returned to the USA to try and garner support for the anti-treaty movement. There, she was even arrested when she occupied the offices of the pro-treaty consulate in New York. During these years, Muriel's politics were increasingly radicalising. Never a devout Catholic, she had publicly embraced atheism in 1922, something that would put her at odds with her Republican comrades and particularly Terence McSweeney's sister, Mary. She was also moving radically to the left and in 1923 joined the Irish Communist Party. This coincided with a permanent rupture with Mary McSweeney, who was a deeply conservative Catholic. Their relationship was further complicated by the fact that Mary had been given co-guardianship of Muriel and Terence's daughter, Moira. Partly to escape the fraught relationship with her sister-in-law, in the mid-1920s Muriel left Ireland, entering her daughter in a boarding school in Germany. She threw herself into left-wing communist activism on the continent, living off the inheritance she had received on her 25th birthday. She had a second daughter, Alex, during a relationship with a French intellectual, and then in the late 1920s she married a German communist. Little is known about her life in these years. Indeed, identifying her second husband has been difficult. He is named only as Pullman in most sources. This was a particularly lethal time to be involved in communist activism in Germany in particular. From 1929 onwards, the German left was locked in a death struggle with the rising power of Nazism. Indeed, Pullman, Muriel's second husband, was executed by the Nazis when they came to power. It was during these years that a darker side of Muriel's personality emerged. Through the 1920s, she was increasingly embroiled in what amounted to a custody battle with Terence McSweeney's sister Mary over her daughter Moira. In 1932, Mary McSweeney, depending on whose version of events you believe, kidnapped or either rescued Moira and brought her back to Ireland, triggering court proceedings. In the end, Muriel would lose custody of her own daughter. Two years later, in 1934, when Moira was only 16, she had the option of returning to Muriel. However, she decided to stay with her aunt in Ireland, where she was enjoying more stability than she had ever known. Muriel, in reaction to this, never spoke to her daughter Moira ever again. Later, when Moira was married, and again when she was expecting her first child, she tried to contact her mother Muriel, but on both occasions Muriel refused to reply, essentially ending the relationship with her only child from her marriage with Terence McSweeney. 
Politically speaking, Muriel remained committed to communism. She would flee her home in France when the Nazis invaded in 1940. Remarkably, given everything she had been through, she was still only in her 40s at this point and she worked in a hospital in Oxford during the Second World War. With most historical figures, the closer we get to the present day, the more we know about their lives, but the same cannot be said for Muriel. As the 20th century progressed, less and less was known about her life. When she died outside London in 1982, she was almost entirely forgotten and airbrushed from Irish history. An Irish Times article in 2012 by Mary Leland about her daughter Moira concluded, What about Muriel herself? The obituaries of Moira speak of her father Terence McSweeney. Of her mother, nothing is said. In one case, not even her name was given. Indeed, most histories of the revolutionary period mentioned Muriel McSweeney only in terms of being the dilettant daughter of wealthy parents who married a famous man. She was far more than this. Indeed, her commitment to her ideals was lifelong and cost her immensely on a personal level, yet she remained active for several decades. She lived a remarkable life. Muriel McSweeney was 90 years of age when she died on October the 26th, 1982. The next episode is out on Monday week, and that's a live recording in the Matter Hospital, looking at the fascinating history of this Dublin institution. Don't forget to get your unique set of those badges at irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash shop. That's irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash shop. Until next time, Sloan.